welcome back to another week of the Back to Space News Flash. I'm back from Mexico, if you can't tell by my non-existent tan. This is actually a pretty tan for me. So, before we get into it, I will announce the winner of this last week's giveaway. Is that the Little Mermaid? Okay, ready? And it is Emil Regis Raquel Terzif Goodfree. You won! Yay! You won the hat! So we will go ahead and get in contact with you and get that sent your way. But um, don't go away because we have another giveaway at the end of this video. So let's get started. I missed. All right, guys, we have Elon Musk making news as he announced that SpaceX long-term goals for reusable rocket launch capabilities will actually be cheaper than we all thought. They've made a lot of progress towards this reusable rocket goal, and now frequently they're reflying parts of their Falcon 9 rockets and their Dragon cargo capsule. But the Starship they're building now, the cool futuristic looking thing, that should be even more reusable, and it's gonna help SpaceX save that sweet, sweet cash money. <laughs> Must provide an idea of just how much that could save SpaceX and by the distributive property, the customers, at a surprise guest appearance at the US Air Force annual pitch day in LA this week. Speaking with United States Air Force Lieutenant General John Thompson at the event via space.com, Musk said that fuel costs for the Starship could be around 900,000 per launch. And that once you factor in the operational costs, it'll probably add up to around 2 million per use. That's, quote, much less than even a tiny rocket. Musk said, explaining why he views it as imperative that this launch system needs to be made. Although two million sounds pretty steep for us mere mortals, it's actually not that much in space money. I hope that becomes a new currency. Just for reference, the average cost to launch the space shuttle is about 450 million per mission. And Apollo 11 was 355 million, and that was way back then. So way to go, Elon. NASA Voyager 2 spacecraft was shot into interstellar space and gave its first findings after leaving the solar system. So guys, this thing lifted off 40 years ago and made a 10 billion mile journey. Cool fact, also a year ago, exactly, it passed out of the sun's protective bubble and into interstellar space, making it the second man-made object to travel outside the limits of our sun influence and into interstellar. Its twin, Voyager 1, was launched 15 minutes after Voyager 2. That was very confusing, as I double and triple checked that 2 actually became, be, came before 1. Anyways, its twin, Voyager 2, already made this pass out of the sun bubble and into interstellar space six years earlier, as they are on different trajectories, and it's moving way faster than Voyager 2. So what did they find in the furthest reaches of our cosmic neighborhood? In a series of papers published by the Nature Astronomy, researchers confirmed the spacecraft's journey into the space between the stars, end quote, by noting a definitive jump in the density of the plasma made up of charged particles and gas in interstellar space. This was detected on the probe of the Voyager 2, making its way from hot, lower density of plasma characteristics of the solar wing to be cool, higher density plasma of interstellar space. The astronomers are looking to understand how the solar winds, the stream of charged particles coming from the sun, interact with the interstellar winds made up of particles from other stars. I think it's pretty cool that they have two of these guys with different missions. They say that their different mission goals and trajectories give valuable clues about the structure of the heliosphere. Cool. Quick update from Boeing Starliner, the somewhat disappointing, over budget, many delayed, and multiple setbacked crew capable spacecraft. Wow, talk about tongue twister. As we all know, NASA is paying Boeing some serious cash money for their work, and we're all waiting to see their progress. On Monday, Boeing had a chance to show off that the Starliner project was nearing the finish line with a launch abort test to demonstrate the capsule's ability to keep the crew safe in an event of serious failure during the launch. The spacecraft proved to be acceptable, according to NASA, but it wasn't perfect. It managed to safely push itself away from the pad, which is exactly what it is designed to do, but one of its three parachutes failed to open during its descent. Better luck next time. Every vote counts, even when you're in space. American astronaut Andrew Morgan has been chilling in space for four months, but a little bit of space didn't stop him from voting. <laughs> 
Early last month, Morgan was sent a ballot and a secure password via email. I hope he was voting for Granger Weasley 2020. Speaking of politics, we live in a world that is very divided. Fortunately, a bipartisan group of senators filed a new bill that sets out the space policy over the next decade, including an action to extend the space station to 2030. The new authorizing legislation is largely consistent with much of NASA's present activities, but it differs from what the White House policy in some key respects. So Trump's administration has sought to commercialize space stations in low Earth orbit by 2025. But Ted Cruz, one of the bipartisan senators, said, by extending the ISS through 2030, this legislation will help grow our already burgeoning space economy, fortifying the United States' leadership in space, increasing American competitiveness around the world, and creating more jobs and opportunities here at home. Senator Cruz chairs a subcommittee on space and aviation. So I like the fact that space is uniting us all, so let's keep it this way and be nice in the comments. The past. On November 9th, it was Carl Sagan Day and it was also his birthday. It's been observed annually since 2009. We all celebrate his life, his teachings, and his legacy. So how did some people observe? Many social media posts about his impact on people's lives, people read his popular books, or even watched the cosmos. On November 9th, 1967, NASA launched the powerful new Saturn V rocket on its maiden voyage. I got those from space.com because they are the best. The Saturn V was 363 feet tall. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty. It was the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built. NASA needed this powerful rocket to launch astronauts to the moon. However, the first Saturn V launch didn't carry astronauts because it was only a test flight. During the launch, the rocket created a loud shockwave that surprised nearby observers. The ground shook so hard it rattled buildings miles away, and all the shaking caused a huge shower of dust and debris in NASA's new launch center. The mission lasted eight hours and 36 minutes. The rocket carried a spacecraft that splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. One year later, another Saturn V rocket launched the first astronauts to the moon with the Apollo 8 mission. All the Apollo missions that followed also launched on the Saturn V rocket. So, happy birthday, Saturn V. The future. Elon is killing it in the news this week as he said via Twitter his company will unveil its all electric cyber truck November 21st in Los Angeles. And in true Elon fashion, it's the same day as an auto show. This is my stage now. Little is known about the, what the Cybertruck will look like, although there's plenty of speculation. Last month, Musk said the Cybertruck doesn't look like anything he's seen on the internet, a reference to the numerous speculative renderings out there. You guys don't know, so stop trying. Let it be a surprise. He also went to talk about his timeline and vehicle requirements to not only reach Mars, but to set up a sustainable base on the red planet. Does this guy sleep? I'm actually confused about that because he's doing like 500 million thousand things. In order to make this city a reality, SpaceX will need to build and fly around a thousand starships, according to his estimate, which will need to transport cargo, infrastructure, and crew to Mars over the course of around 20 years. Since planetary alignment only really allows for a realistically achievable Mars flight once every two years. So India is making some new space waves as they have a new destination in mind. Venus. Scientists at the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, have sent plans for a Venus orbiter to the Indian national government, and they are waiting and hoping that they'll get the green flag of approval. The spacecraft would launch in a few years carrying tons of instruments. The overall goal would be to map the Venusian surface and subsurface. The findings would help scientists identify volcanic hotspots scattered around Venus. Here's a futuristic sci-fi idea I read on space.com and had to tell you about. Could we one day combine tardigrade DNA with our cells to go to Mars? Chris Mason, a geneticist and associate professor of physiology and biophysics at Cornell University in New York, has investigated the genetic effects of spaceflight and how humans might overcome these challenges to expand our species farther into the solar system. One of the strangest ways that we might protect future astronauts on missions to places like Mars. Mason said it might involve the DNA of tardigrades, tiny micro animals that can survive the most extreme conditions even in the vacuum of space. Mason was one of 10 researchers NASA chose to study the twin astronauts Mark and Scott Kelly. 
by comparing how they biologically reacted to their vastly different environments. During that time, scientists aimed to learn more about how the long duration missions affects the human body. Mason and dozens of other researchers who worked to assist the genetic effects of space life uncovered a wealth of data that has so far revealed many new findings about how space affects the human body. I can't wait to hear more about the tardigrades. Tardigrades. Today, our giveaway is a fantastic shirt. Wow, look at this. So if you would like to support this fashion thing, make sure you leave a comment, you're subscribed to this channel, and you tune in next week to see who wins. Our shout out this week is to inspiring figures. Dwayne Yeeter and Rebecca Gladen interviewed me forever ago when I was just starting out back to space. <laughs> Feels like yesterday and 10 years ago all at the same time. And since then, they've been incredibly supportive. So go ahead and check out their website and read some of their amazing interviews they have with incredibly special people. Also, please check out our collaboration with Universe Today. I saw a lot of the comments here are from that video, so welcome new subscribers. We're happy to have you. And our student researcher of the week is Trey Hackman. Trey flies FPV airplanes and has built a UAV that can fly 10 miles away. For loving space as much as he does, he has never seen a rocket launch in person. Last summer, he built an aquaponics farm in his garage where he grew green beans and raised catfish in the same system. In his free time, he assists with the construction of two P-26 aircrafts at a local hangar. Way to go, Trey. Thanks for the info and uh, keep flying on. Thanks everyone so much for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, and check out next week to see about this shirt. It's pretty dang cool if you ask me. All right guys, have a good one. See you next week.